Nice. Okay, so let's do it. DevOps at scale, Greek tragedy in three acts. So we're going to do to talk about DevOps at scale, and as the name gives away, it's a Greek tragedy, so everybody dies. Like a good Greek tragedy yeah. is supposed to be. As, as the format implies, everybody dies, which actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it because it's DevOps at scale. It cannot be anything else. No, it, it's not easy. Right. So, um, so we are going to get to Act 1 after a short prologue in which first we will introduce ourselves. Well, first we thank the audience because we are standing between them and the wine. Right, exactly. And uh, so if you hate us now, standing between you and the wine, just wait for it. Just wait for it, indeed. Right. Uh, so... Uh, we start with you. Okay, so uh, my name is Baruch Sadogurski. I'm developer advocate with JFrog, the amazing company that brought you Swamp Up, as you might guess by the letters right here. Uh, and my name is Leonid Golik. I'm VP of Engineering with CA Technologies. I'm working our security business in charge of our SaaS products. <laughs> Prior to CA, worked at companies like Teller and Oracle on some of the largest SaaS properties in the world running development and operations. So, as I usually represent Leonid, he's awesome. That was a summary of what he Was, was there somebody standing behind me? Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, 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 I have that. I That's have your that. slide. That's I, your well, slide. Since I do work for a large technology company, I do have to tell you, because we have lawyers, a, 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 a floor of that. <laughs> uh, but more on that later in the talk, that the opinions in this talk are mine and my own and do not represent CA Technologies. Good. With they, that. Uh, I don't know if they represent JFrog, though, but I don't have to have this slide yet. Okay. Your lawyer is not here. Right. So every good talk about DevOps should start with this slide. Right. What the hell is DevOps? Uh, because um, as uh, any technology buzz, uh, everybody think uh, about it slightly different. And there are companies that make millions on this fact. That and we're not no, going to be any different. That no, no one knows what DevOps uh, is. And... Uh, uh, we're going to explain this concept as every other good concept with Venn diagram. Well, and Greeks love them. Yeah, so apparently we didn't invent them, and Greeks already did this before us. And uh, the Venn diagram of DevOps is, of course, that, right? We have uh, um, development, and we have operations, and they are blended together, and then they came with the fancy name, DevOps. And, and they forgot. Uh, after a couple of years, they discovered that probably quality is also a big deal. So they kind of added the QA on the side. The name didn't quite flow. Yeah, Dev Q QA Ops. Q no, so they stuck to DevOps. But yeah, the QA should be there as our release engineer, Eli Givoni right there, should probably agree. Right, QA is a part of DevOps? It is, right. So this is DevOps and uh, that's kind of a traditional view of, um, of this concept. But today we're going to talk about different in the talk, of we it. wanted to project a slightly different lens on the DevOps as a phenomenon, and we wanted to talk about technology, people, and process. Some things people tend to forget as they try to implement DevOps at the little scale or at large scale with thousands and thousands of engineers. So, indeed, changes to all three of them and blending, blending of all three of them are DevOps yeah. as well. Well, let us introduce you to our heroes, the mythical company called Pentagon Inc. They do c a credit card processing, and maybe they have some relationship with the other company with geographical, uh, geometrical shape name. That Slightly do. different from Pentagon, less squares or corners. By wine? Yeah, no, that joke never works. No, no, no. Okay. okay. Anyhow, Pentagon Inc., we're going to take them through our scale, and we will start with Act 1, which is called Fire Brigade or Reactive Ops. That means that they constantly fi fight fires. Well, we'll find out. So let's so, set the stage. Yeah, so setting the stage is the first thing we do. And as you remember, people, processes, tools. tools. People, three developers. Three guys left their existing jobs, decided to get into the business, used to work in defense. Maybe that's why they chose the name. We will never know. But, uh, you know, they're heavily, heavily traditional software on-premise background. But they are smart guys. Like they, they know worked on some really sophisticated software. They know exactly what they are doing. A little bit hipsterish, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. There's like, you look at the tech stack. 
And the tech stack will be JavaScript, Node, Reactive, Microservices, a lot of hipsterish buzzwords. But you know what? When you do them right, they can actually produce good software. Well, they go to conferences, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Swamba, probably one of them. No, we don't th talk about any of those. Maybe Microsoft, microservices a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, process. What kind of process the company of three people has? Well, Kanban. What else do you need? And this can be Trello, Jira, whiteboard, sticky notes, something very, very simple. They don't need to talk a lot about process. Right? They're competent engineers. We spoke about it. They are smart guys, so they know that quality is important, and they know that the developers are the ones that put the basis for, for quality. So they do test-driven development. They develop automatic unit and integration tests. Push the test. Everything's there. Now, when it comes to ops, again, they go to conferences, so they, they heard this thing called what ops? Oh, yep. no ops. No ops is yeah. a great trend. That and means. those guys are very sympathetic with this trend because they are developers. You tell them you don't need ops, they're like, yay, we don't yeah, need ops. Those guys that used to take our access to production away, right? Right. Like, why so, would you want them in, in the mix? Another very nice trend they really kind of like is serverless. What serverless means? Well, it means you're just using somebody else's server. Which is, it's not on my, I, I don't need to babysit it, that's great, yeah. right? So they're, they're be magical. Yeah, they're kind of hooked into this serverless no ops thing because it's super cool. Tools again minimal, minimal. right? So what else do you need? So we mentioned Jira or or Trello or whatever for um, for their uh, Kanban and uh, GitHub for sources, of course, in the cloud. Don't need to ma maintain servers. Um, Travis CI, who knows what Travis CI is? Okay. Nice. This is pretty good. Yeah, we should probably replace it with Circle CI, considering our partners and exhibitors here at uh, Swamp Up. Um, it's just a cloud CI server, right? Serverless. Yeah, so it can be anything of this type. Uh, and then platform as, um, uh, as a deployment platform, what something, else something serverless. Yep. Right, so AWS is a good option. Google Cloud Platform is a great option. Azure is a like great option. Automated deployment orchestration out of the box, something like simple. They didn't yeah. need anything more. So any of those can actually work. So what do you say? Should work, right? right. That, they, they a good place to start. Yeah, they, they build a good minimalistic product that actually worked. Well, let us begin. The first, the action of the first part starts with the normal mode of operations for a startup that just produced the product. You work hard for a long, long time, and then you sit and wait for the first customer. Right? So this is what they do. They sit and wait, and then, hallelujah. They got the first customer. What do you do when you get your first customer? What do you do when you get your first customer? Your dream. Right there. We're now Thank you your very dream. much. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, uh, you know, to our first customer. Mm. Ah. Yeah, so this is naturally Friday night, right? No, the, the Thursday was drinking. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, well it's some It's always on Friday. Right, so it is, it is a late night celebration and everything, uh, but I, I, just in a couple of minutes. I told you you will hate us more. Now it's the time to hate us more. Now, um, like, they got a good customer, by the way. We didn't talk about it. Right. A major celebrity personality who wanted payment processing for her. Something starts with the K and with Ashen. Ashen something, yeah. right? Something big, right? So it's awesome. They're happy. They launched. And then Friday comes. And then the customer calls. Nothing works. <laughs> like. Literally, your system is down. Like, we, we can't get anything. We just launched a major campaign. Nothing works. So what do you do then? Well, what do you do when the customer calls and tells you nothing works? No, uh, you, you do that. No, that's later. You panic. First, you panic. OK, so um, after you're done doing that, you charge. Now, it's very simple. Three developers, someone did something wrong. What? They're all in the same room. Good news says there's no ops. We have access to production. Right. Let's go check it out. So, so what we need is to probably check the logs. Wait, where are the logs? Um, um, in the cloud. Oh, and like in one place? No, we microservices. We have 20 services with 20 logs. Oh. 
OK, let's start looking. Uh, I, there's this error in this log over here for this component. You know what? I think I can see the trace of it. Well, mine is at 2 AM. And mine is at 5 AM. Can't be the same. Well, wait, uh, oh, oh. or can it? Oh, is it? Wait, wait, are the servers in the same time zone? Of course not. Oh. Why would they be? <laughs> well, after a little uh, time zone acrobatics, we do find the error. Well, yeah, so the error is, um, out of those three, there is one guy called Billy. Billy. We Billy. meet Billy. Billy. Welcome, Billy. Remember that name. Yeah. So Billy, he got carried away a little bit in the celebration last night, and then he thought about the brilliant idea, so he coded it. Naturally, and it went through CI, CD testing, and went to production. Right. And uh, yeah, there was a bug there. Well, you know what? Dude, should be easy. Why don't we just roll it back? Let me. Let me undo the fix, right? We'll All you need it. to do is a, previous, is a previous commit. Hold on a sec, let me do that. Wait, it, it, it doesn't build. That cannot be because it was just built a couple of hours ago. No, no, it's saying there's this missing dependency thing. Like, a, have you heard of this library, left oh, pad? Left pad. <laughs> Unpublished gate, NPM gate, anyone? Any, any, has anybody okay, got okay. No, no, by, no, uh, yeah, no, no hipsters and no hipsters. No, 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 there's some, no, there's a lot of nods. Okay, okay. So let me let me tell you the great story of left pad and unpublished gate. There is this central repository, central registry, npm registry for npm components. In this registry, there are tons of very useful libraries. One of them is called left pad. Left pad is a glorious it's a huge, library. Huge library. 12 lines of JavaScript code, which does, as you might guess by the name, padding of string to the left. Financials, old school, sometimes fixed width records, you need that. So this is what it does. Now, the guy that developed this library got upset with the maintainers of this NPM registry and decided that he's going to take down his library. And, and you, you, are all, you are all reasonable people, <laughs> so you think by now how much damage a stupid library that pads string from the left can do. In 12 lines. In 12 lines? Well, Part of the internet disappeared. All of the internet went down. Everybody, the whole internet, is dependent on left pad. Directly or indirectly, without Trans even knowing that. Transitive dependencies for the win. Anyhow. So this is not a unique problem for Billy and Pentagon Inc. at this stage. They continue to work hard. So it, we can solve it, right? We can find some copy of the, those 12 lines of code, repackage it, push it to some file, local file system, build it from there, and eventually get it running. Probably build on Billy's machine and then push it directly. Yeah, yeah there's no ops. Just uh, push the code straight to right? production. So, so eventually we can fix it, but it's a very repetitive, hard work without much of uh, progress. And so it continues. Every week there is something else. A lot of it we already fixed a couple of weeks ago, and it bites us again and again. But, uh, you know, they're smart guys, they persevere, and we enter our act two. Which is know, called the smoke, smoke alarm installers, also known as reactive improvement. Right, so they now, kind of matured a bit. Right, so smoke, smoke alarms are about preventing fires in the places where fires can be. Or have started previously. Right, and this is what this mode is about. So let's see. Let's see what, what, what the company is looking like right now. So um, we have some news in all three of the aspects that we are talking about. News and people, round A. They raised some money. They raised some money. They, they've been successful with customers, so you hire more developers. And now they have 30 people, 26 new developers. Oh, and they have this one whole human being that knows about ops. Oh, yes. One of them have ops background, and he is alive. Yeah, and, and he's there. Like he's the with us. Like the whole person. Right? A hundred customers, uh, not, which is a nice growth. Right? They're not, not the single uh, customer anymore. A support team, right? So they get a little bit tired of waking up every night. Or answering basic things, so they hire a support team. Which now are the first line of defense and answering the, the, yep. the, the easy questions, right? 
Uh, let's talk a bit about the process. Naturally, you know, there are more people now. You need slightly different development process. So they transition slowly out of Kanban. They go to something like Scrum or maybe Scrumban, something a bit more mature. They've discovered that there's a third component. Wait a second. Ellie here in the crowd. That's our um, main QN release guy. Ellie, do you know what exploratory testing is? Of course. Well, what is it? It's. Oh. That's an excellent one. Good answer. You know what I like him about him? Good. So exploratory testing is a fancy name for manual QA. But they, they realize that you know, TDD doesn't cover everything. Sometimes you have to try the unexpected. You, you need somebody with a background that knows what good testing practices look like. And here are the bad news. Oh, yeah, they got the guy. They got the guy that actually told them that there is no such thing like no ops. And serverless means there are servers. They are. Just somebody else's. So nice. now they actually realize a lot of things they didn't realize like before. Having UTC as the time zone on your servers is good for log correlation. Yeah, we'll go in into the middle that. of the night. Yeah, right. Developer on call. Well, they have this new thing, right? The support guys need to call somebody, and they realize that waking the entire team up in the middle of the night doesn't work every emergency. So they now have a rotating position. Right. Somebody goes on call probably for a week. They have a number that routes to their cell phone. They wake up. They try to figure out the issue. So that's, that's an improvement. And of course, as I mentioned, we figured out the thing with, with, with the, the clock, logs with the clock. and the clocks. It's right? amazing how many people get bit by this. Right. <laughs> so once you said everything you did see, the life is easier. And this is exactly what they did. So now, tools have to evolve. Yeah, so tools, tools evolve, uh, obviously, as well. So uh, now they need to have a knowledge base. And that's important for the support team. And for the developer on call. Because like he wakes up in the middle of the night. It's a big system. He doesn't work on the whole thing. Sometimes you need to know what to do. The whole idea about it, not waking up other people. So we document instead, right? GitHub, uh, CircleCI, and uh, everything else stays. Now they have something new, JFrogerty Factory. Now, why they need JavaScript Factory? We know why. First, we need to cache this left pad thing. And second, if you we want, want to roll back. Uh, if we need to clean up after Billy, all, oh, we yeah, need Billy. To do, all we need to do is take the previous build results. Right? It'll so be that, easy. That, that's good. Right? Now, good of course, they've realized that aggregating logs by hand from hundreds of AWS console screens is not the most convenient thing. So they got a log management solution. And in our example, it naturally will be Sumo Logic, which are other partners and sponsors of Swamp again. Right? So Sumo Logic are great. And then, because they have the ops guy, here you go. They've got this thing called the Pingdom. Who remembers Pingdom? Who are as old and as, as us. Two, uh, Don't be shy. Don't be we, shy. We, we young inside. <laughs> <laughs> very. So, ping down, very simple tool. Oh, yeah, that's sophisticated APM. Are you right? there? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm fine. That's what it does. Right. So, it does one thing. It goes to the URL, and it returns whether it's up or not. Hey, they've learned that it's better to know before the customer calls them and tells them they're down. Right. So. So the problem down. that we started with won't happen again. That's a good thing. OK, so I think we are up to the next act. Let us see what happens. Right. So as you remember, they raised money. What does a good startup do when they raise money? They drink. <laughs> here you it's go. It's a party, right? We're spending VC money here, so. You didn't hear that. Ah. OK, this is, this is our investor. Like, no, I'm not kidding. And, and, and you think he doesn't know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So, and then, of course, something else happens. Customer this, calls. This time is different. Um, it's different because we, we already learned, right? So there is no way the customer will just call us like well, everything like the is whole down. Thing goes down, right? Right. Not not, no. not happening. But, but the system is uh, not quite working. So the customer calls and say, "Hey, we launched this campaign." And everybody who tries to process a transaction using American Express can't seem to get through. And our support lines are exploding. We have this TV ad. So the visas and MasterCards are fine, and American Express doesn't, go, doesn't work. So what do you do when a customer calls like that on Friday? You should know by now. Agreed. No, you're fine. No, you, you missed. No, you drink after you fix the problem. Right. So 
first of all, you panic, right? Now we have the support guys, they are the one to panic, but eventually they got through that and they charge. Now, what do they do? First well, of all, the they support guys page the developer on call, that's easy. First of all, they check the knowledge base. Well, the support guys. Right, there is not much there, so they page the developer on call. Well, the developer on call kind of looks at it and goes, I, I don't know what's going That's on. That's not my part of the system, I don't know. But fortunately, they do have a knowledge base, so he goes and finds a subject matter expert for American Express. And guess who it is? Billy! Billy! <laughs> so he calls Billy. Naturally, it's Friday. After the, so Billy is wasted. <laughs> like Billy, Billy is not. That seems to be a natural state for Billy. <laughs> but he's unconscious. And, and he's like, yeah, American Express, yeah. So I. Let's look at the logs. We have the tools, we're looking, and it's like. Okay, so the thing is apparently the queue for American Express transactions is exploding. And he's like, Billy, like, yeah, I remember already fixing this problem. Yeah, just like. Two days ago. Yeah, so I implemented a fix that throws away all the transactions if there are too much in the queue, which is the obvious thing to do yeah, for, like, like, for financial like companies, right? Just, like, this is what they do. Right. Well, it's called uh, you know gradual gradual degradation of exactly service. right. So, but the thing is, it's not implemented in production yet, so it's kind of unclear. Wait, wait, wait! But I, I'm looking at the bug tracking system, and it says fixed and closed, so that should mean it's got. Promoted. Well, apparently it's not because we've seen the logs that it wasn't. Okay, well, let's let's go. Fortunately, they have click to build, reproducible build, define the pull request. Apparently, Billy closed the bug before things got merged. Oops. That happens with Billy a lot. And eventually, everything is just fine. But then something new happens. And this is a very important uh, symptom of this stage. If you want to self-diagnose kind of where you are, or maybe the team you know where you are, you know, uh, something happens. People get together on Monday, not on Friday, not on Saturday nope. morning. Nope. After the emergency has passed, the customer is happy. They get together on Monday and they do a retrospective, right? And here's a, an example. This happens to be from one of my products at CA. You so need we, a laser point here. Uh, so we uh, obscured the name uh, of certain things to protect the, uh, perhaps not so. In not innocent. No. Right? <laughs> So let's talk about what a good retrospective would be and what documents should come out of it, right? This is our root cause analysis report. It will highlight which environment this happened because we may have multiple different environments, multiple deployments of the software, kind of what was the affected area, when did we complete the RCA, some basic fundamentals, tracking numbers for defects, you know, how long the services were affected, and then we have this event log. How do, how do you even know? I mean, do you have this... Um, a lady that sits in the corner of the war room with the tiny type machine and types everything that like happens? Like the legal secretary? The yep. cook, no, we don't. Nope. Now, typically, modern, modern software teams have something like Slack, FlowDoc, or some other collaboration software. They will have a dedicated channel for emergencies where everything, everybody gets together, and that eventually serves as the log of events, and that's important because when you did the retrospective a couple days later, it's very difficult to remember the time. Exactly, right. Like what happened before what, and it's also good later as the company matures because if you're on the audit, sometimes you need to be able to produce those, right? So we have just, just the sequence of events of everybody uses the same facts before we start interpreting. This is our facts, right? Then we're going to symptoms. Right? Uh, there's a verbal description for symptom. That's very useful because as your RCA base and your knowledge base grows, it's easy to find an incident that may have happened in a similar area to understand what was the defect. Maybe the defect got filed but is not fixed yet. So this is very useful for our example and the knowledge base will get another article which the symptoms will be American Express cards won't go through. Right, and the queue were erroring out. That's not the symptom, that's the technical detail. It depends. It's a technical. Then you have proper analysis, right? People sit together, and like a good retrospective is not. Well, let me let's talk about a bad retrospective. Bad retrospective is a bunch of people on a conference call finger pointing, and known as the blame game. A good retrospective is a very detailed analysis of the facts, the symptoms, and most importantly, identifying what was the root cause. And what do you need to do to make sure this thing never happens again? So here is very simple. Billy committed some shit. Or he had a naive assumption about a queue size that was hard-coded, not configurable, not easily monitorable. That's better. Right? So you identify your root cause, and then most important part of it, you want to catalog next steps, and ideally those next steps are actionable. So in our case, we point to a defect 
in the in the defect database, right? And we decided that we needed to make a process change, right? Well, for our example, this is very simple. The next steps will be enlarge the goddamn American Express queue, right? This is very simple. Huh. And the, the question is, how? Mu by how much? Well, now, now you ask Billy, and Billy does that, and Billy says 42. Why? It's a great number. Right? It's, it's an answer to all things in the universe. So and it's number. prime, and it's a power of two. I like 42. It can't be prime, but OK. <laughs> power of two, you know, prime doesn't work. But let's continue. <laughs> that was a joke, Leonid. <laughs> OK, right, sorry about that. So yeah, so the thing is we guess, we have no idea. Now, the most important thing about this document, and we talked about um, you know, the customer, you also, in most cases, want to show them what happened, right? In its all fully glory, guts, gutsy, bloody details. And you would think, why? Is that really a good idea to tell your customer what happened behind the kimono? The interesting... Um fact about our industry that we learned as an industry after a lot of trials and errors is that transparency and trust with customers go very mm -hmm. long way. And, and customers will forgive you. Whatever you do, how horrible your sins are, if you do this mistake once. once. And you would think never, now that you, there, there are mistakes that are unforgivable. And but OK, who thinks there are mistakes that are unf unforgivable? Well, let's say like the most important thing the software as a service system has is the data that the customer entrusts in it. In production. So in production. let's say someone deletes data in production. Will they ever be forgotten, for, forgotten like or the, they will go out the, of business? This thing can kill a company, right? Yeah. Well, believe it or not, it did happen recently. Remember those? The GitLab database incident that happened on February 1st this year, just a couple of months ago. Now, what actually happens is that someone called team member one, Billy, deleted a production database with... By accident. By accident. Now, that happens, right? Who, who didn't delete a production database in his life? I, I've done it at least once. Oh, um, you are so young. You have future grasshopper. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, we all did it, and that's fine because what? We have backups. Because we have backups. So now let's see how backups worked for GitLab. Ah, this, uh, this is like watching a thriller. Oh, yes, that's, that's great. Are you ready? So we apparently have backups, but um, uh, no one knows where they are. Um, eventually, they find the backups. And all the files of backups are empty. Oops. No despair. We also have SQL dumps. Oh, good. The, the problem is that SQL dumps oh. were done with a client of incompatible version with the database server. So actually, no dumps were done. But don't despair. Never despair. How about, yeah, so no, no dumps. How about disk snapshots? where no one ever took disk snapshots for databases. We have the rest, but not the database. Yes. And uh, replication. Replication can solve the problem. The process is fragile, prone to error, relies on a handful of random shell scripts, and badly documented. Uh, it didn't work. No. Yeah. But wait, they have backups to S3, I heard. Uh, oh, and wait. all the buckets are empty. Well, all in all, and that's like that's true story, right? We we couldn't invent that. Like this is a true incident report that uh, GitLab published. Five backup replication techniques, no, any, no one worked. They lost six hours of production data. Of production this is data. the worst thing you can do as a service, as a server, a software as a service vendor. Customers will give you and run the error in the screen or something not working as expected. You start corrupting data, you, you're typically as good as dead. And we were like, well, that's a shame. GitLab are, are nice guys, and we hate to see them go. And then they publish that, and magic happens. No, this is not the magic. This is us. <laughs> but this <laughs> is magic. Right. And this is the reaction of the community to their honest, transparent, honest, transparent, transparent. And direct retrospective, right? Je suis team member one. 
This is what That's the, the guy who deleted the database. Got promoted, by the way. 300 bucks from Google to get yourself cookies and apparently booze. Uh, our friends from CodeFresh. Our friends are CodeFresh, which are our partners and, of course, exhibitors here at SwampUp, said three boxes of cookies as well. The, so there was, they got so much love for their transparency that you could never believe that it's a company that just deleted three, six hours of customer data. So this is a big deal, right? And you should do that. Right. And I think very often, and this is painful, and we, we will talk more about pain as an instrument of evolving your processes, but the most important thing people forget when they shift to software as a service is there is a second S in SaaS, which is service, right? And I've done, I've run some of the largest SaaS products in the world, and I, we had incidents, everybody does. It's how you communicate to the customer about what happened and what are you going to do to make sure it will never happen again and demonstrate to them that you have a repeatable and reliable process of doing it, also known as installing a smoke alarm, potentially, whether it's monitoring the queue size, whether it's monitoring the backup process, right? This is what allows you to evolve, right? This is the key fundamental items that help you with continuous improvement. And that, the smoke alarm installers. And now we're getting to our third arc, well, third act, which is the tragedy culmination where everybody dies, also known as the perfect storm. They have to die. All right. So let's set the stage first and let's see what's happening. First of all, in people. Well, they've adopted the continuous improvement process. They've gotten the retrospectives going, so they got another round of finding. Good news, more money means more developers. They are big guys now. They have 100 engineers. One of them is the whole performance engineer, like, like the whole thing. human being that yeah. understands performance. Yeah, yeah, that that's, was a very hard to find, but they, they managed. And the, the ops team got tired of being on call, the, the whole previous human, yeah. so well, they hired four more, five more. We'll, we'll get, you're right, right, so five developers with all background. Right. Chief architect. Oh yeah, it's that time of the year where the chief architect shows up and starts generating things like non-functional backlog. What? The hell uh, later. More about okay, that later. more about that. Customer success team. That's an interesting one. That's an interesting one because they've realized that uh, you know developer on call is all good, but like with hundred people rotating, everybody is still important. Everybody has to feel the pain of the work they do. But I also decided to create a team, uh, and there are a variety of ways of doing it that gets interrupted, so the broader development team doesn't have to, right? You may, some people rotate people in and out. I had the engineers on my teams who didn't want to leave the customer success team because for them it's like solving detective stories, right? Who killed the patient, right? Usually they did. Well, no, usually it's the, the, the rest of the dev team, right? So, really? That's so we, you typically put an isolated team, depending on the size, maybe five, six people. In addition to being on call, their job was to be the first line of defense. Because with this size of the team, escalations happened. Somebody has to go investigate the defect, triage the defect, maybe support the support team, and we'll talk a bit about that later. Right. So, um, legal. Oh. Uh, yeah, they hired the legal guy. Don't you love those guys? Yes. Well, he's going to appear soon. Um, um, CFO, someone has to count the expenses by then. Well, at round B. Right, right. The company. Um, a thousand customers. Yeah, that, that, that's a respectable, a company. respectable company, right? So naturally, the process has to evolve. Oh, yes. It was 100 people and probably a couple sites. They went above Scrum and they realized that you need like more methodology about like where, what do you do with the stuff that the architect generates, right? So they've adopted this thing called Safe Scale, Scaled Agile Framework. It's a set of processes above like the fundamental Scrum that can help you run the teams. But sometimes you want to run a program, right, together. So they've adopted Scale. They created a new team, system testing. With 100 engineers, somebody has to take care of things like the labs, right. performance testing frameworks, harnesses, somebody who understands what does it take to take a set of components, right? Microservices, we started with 20 at the beginning, probably close to 100 by now, and how do you bring them as the whole system, right, that works cohesively, consistently, and that's their charter. Okay, now this is where you should stand up and leave this room because we're, go we're talking about DevOps and there is no such thing as ops team, right? Well, so what's going on here? Well, apparently somebody has to worry about things like customer SLA reporting, external metric monitoring, capacity planning, um, uh, audit compliance, and variety of other things that actually come with scale. 
right? And you, as you continue to grow and scale, you start creating some specialization. And those are the guys that know the stuff inside out. If anybody had the fortune of taking a product FedRAMP, I'll drink with you later in, in, in the cave. It's a lot of fun to become FedRAMP certified. But you need somebody who knows the process inside out, and that's why this specialization emerges. And also, I see the DevOps team as the enablers of DevOps for the entire company, right? Those, this is the DevOps as a service that we're going to talk about in our panel tomorrow, in which we have a team that builds monitors and makes accessible the tools that the rest organization use to be DevOps organization. Yeah. They have this new process for their own call, right? They, they, they realize the team is big enough, the, the system is big enough, so there's more than one person on call. There's this SME on call from each key area of the system. But they also have a manager on call because sometimes somebody has to direct the firefighting, right? And, and sometimes they have to make some decisions, wake other people. Right, so it goes all the way to the CEO, which might sound strange, but first of all, sometimes there are problems that CEO needs to solve. And by solve, I mean going golf the next weekend. Right, now, the other reason, anybody can think of any other reasons why you put a CEO at the top of your escalation chain and like- With, the, with his mobile number? With the mobile number, yeah. No. no, no. You the put the CEO reason. there with like eight-hour incident window with certain severity, so nobody even wants to call the CEO and solves the problem. That guarantees CEO with a mobile number guarantees that by the time that the escalation pipe instruct you, instruct you to call the CEO, the problem will be. It's amazing how many problems get solved that way. Ten minutes before, one minute before but it will be fixed by the time they need to call this number. It's not Magic. Wants to place the call. Magic. Oh, so well, too, this well, is your They've thing. grown, you know, the payment processing company, the PCI DSS compliant, but there's also this thing called standard operating controls type two, the variety of levels, but they, their customers, because their customers have those compliance requirements, they expect it to be compliant, and with that process come interesting things like separation of duties. Right? Wait a second, what does it mean? Well, it means people that uh, do the code or make the decision to promote the software shouldn't be the ones that promote the software. Okay, what you For just example. said is completely not compliant with DevOps, because DevOps means that whoever wrote the code takes this code all the way to production. No, what DevOps, mean, DevOps means under SOC 2 at least is that you have a set of controls that you've executed as part of your change management, and they can be continuous integration, a test suite has to execute, you have to pass some continuous performance test, and then as part of your controls, and by the way, there's a big misnomer that like you have to comply with every control. SOC framework says you can declare which controls you comply with, and you will be audited on that, and it's okay to satisfy those controls in a variety of ways. And like having a continuous tool chain that is auditable with evidence and has gates, is actually as, as good of a criteria for CD as, as anything else in separation of duties. And by the way, great example of how those controls actually are compatible with DevOps can be found in the great books, a book, The Phoenix Project. The because Phoenix that's Project. The Phoenix Project, that's exactly the challenge that they had, and there is an explanation of what you basically just said. All right. So, oh, non-functional backlog. You well, mentioned it with chief architect. You have a chief architect. Somebody has to look at the system as a whole and make sure it evolves in a consistent way, right? There are certain things like testability requirements, scalability requirements, depending on the type of product you have, accessibility requirements, localization requirements, that will emerge out of their chief architect because it's typically a very experienced engineer who's seen that and done that and has the pattern recognition. Like the Fred Simon. Could be. The other things that emerge from a chief architect are standards for, especially very important in microservice environments, like what, what does the service look like? Right? And ideally, those standards are not like just the requirements. They may be patternized in, in a code base or like a standard service prototype that you can inherit. But they absolutely become a, a nature of the game. OK, we need to speed up. So let's get to a, let's review the tools real quick and get to the action of our culmination of our tragedy. So tools, again, involve um, configuration management. That's something that it's about time to have. Um, and of course, proper API. Now, instead of very nice pingdom that will only let us know where the system is up and down, a fully 
Pledge APM actually can guarantee that you know exactly where, which part of the system doesn't work or even are going to become not operational in some time in the future. So this is the, obviously the next step. Now let's get to the action. You remember they raised more money. Got a drink. Oh yes. So this is what we do when we raise more money. Oh, by the way, there is another whole thing, whole uh, reason for celebration. Billy got promoted. Yeah, that's right. Billy is now VP of engineering. Billy, Billy is now a VP of engineering. So, you know, remember in, in when we set the stage, they hired a, a legal person? So Nancy just got back from a conference. They, they have, have conferences, by the way, if you didn't know. Like Any they talk about things like, room? you know, IP protection, litigation, all this other cool stuff. So she heard about this thing called GPL and LGPL. So she comes to Billy and says, hey, Billy, so I just came from a conference and in our code base, do we have any of this non-compliant stuff? Uh, well, what Billy does? You should know by now. And, and then actually Billy does the only thing Billy can do and he makes his developers to go and search for the licenses. And if you've ever been acquired and you didn't have a catalog of that license, you've been through this exercise. Now the good news are they have Artifactory as you remember and uh, in Artifactory all the artifacts and the dependencies are there. So all they need to do is go through a couple of tens, uh, ten thousands of uh, dependencies, open up every archive and look at the descriptor for the license. Trivial and easy and fun job to do for every developer, right? But the fun continues. Oh yes. Now what happens? Now the CFO. Here you go is working with the venture capitalists on the next year's budgets. They're trying to do some projections. So he comes to Billy and says, hey, Billy, for the production environment, how much we should budget for cost of operations next year? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because Billy has absolutely no idea. So Billy does the only thing Billy can do, and it's like 42. Billy, why 42? Um, uh, that's a very um, sophisticated calculation based on what we spent this year and our projection for growth for the next year. And I'm absolutely certain it will be 42 because you know what? You won't shut down my, my production servers no matter how much it no costs. No CFO ever refused the check for production servers. That is true. Well, the fun continues. continues. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Now, that's who knows who that is. Oh. Baruch, if we have to explain the memes, you know, the memes don't work. Okay, so just Google, will it blend? So okay, this guy blends tons of fun stuff, like iPads, iPhones, personal computers. But in this particular case, the our, question is, our head of sales yep. has a great contract he, uh, he wants to close, and he comes to Bill and says, hey, Billy, can we scale to their load? Well, Billy, uh, you know by now. Uh, but again, Billy is now head of engineering. He but has he wrote people. the code. Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, he wrote the code, but also he has people to ask. And he goes to his engineering team and asks, will it scale? Guess what the answer is? Of course it will scale. Like, we wrote this stuff, of course it This will. code is perfect. Yeah. Well. It, it's ready for any kind of scale. Well, um, um, how do you know, guys? Uh, 42. Well, we, we wrote it. It can stand the scale of 42. All right. Well, uh, well yeah, no, it and, didn't. And then the customer no, shows yeah, up no. at the gates, no, 300, everybody dies. Yeah, yeah well, it didn't, but no. <sighs> OK, our time is over, but we are in California. And there are no tragedies in your movies those days. So we will attach to a perfect Greek tragedy a happy ending. Also known as Smokey the Bear or Proactive. So we are going to steal a couple of more minutes of your wine time at the cave to talk a little bit how we can survive the whole tragedy and all this horrible mess. So the process has to evolve, right? You have to start doing performance scalability testing. Ideally, you instrumented your production environment so you get enough telemetry coming from it that you can incrementally improve the system before it degrades too much rather than trying to simulate the load in production. And at certain scales, it's just simply not possible. 
license and security management, as you already heard, this is critical when you are on scale. You need to be in control of what's going on inside your software, both in terms of licenses and in terms of security vulnerabilities. Proactive performance reviews. Right. You probably once a week, once a month, on some periodic basis, get together, look at the telemetry coming out of your system, and start looking at the trends before they degrade beyond acceptable thresholds and try to figure out what to do. Right. And a non-functional definition of done, which is somehow different from non-functional backlog? N it is, because now, in addition to functional definition of done that your product managers care about, the chief specified that your microservice has to scale horizontally, can consume a certain amount of memory, it has to have monitoring endpoints, and ideally, all of those are patternized in code. Nothing gets released until this is done. Tools evolve as well, yeah. right? And we will uh, talk about a couple of examples here in the tools that can help you implement these processes. And um, one of them, uh, for example, is uh, mission control on top of Artifactory that actually lets you see where your software is in terms of the continuous integration and continuous delivery process. JFrog X-Ray is another example for answering this concern of security, uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, license compliance issues. A couple of CA products like BlazeMeter to do load generation for load testing, things like service virtualization. If you have third parties that don't give you test systems, Systems, like very frequently happens in payment processing, so you can mock the third-party APIs and do your regression against those, right? Allows you to do better system testing. Right, so basically there are tools that allow you to implement those, uh, those processes. And uh, a couple of examples how they solve real-life pro problems. So remember that the developers that had to crack open every dependency in Artifactory to figure out the licenses, we can automate those processes. And of course, um, uh, JFrog X-Ray that uh, we spoke all day today and will speak all day tomorrow about um, is one of those tools. And you can see here some uh, license violation about GPL breach, uh, and that's exactly what we spoke about being found inside um, um, some kind of a Java library, inside a war file, inside an archive, and so on inside and so a forth. Debian package, inside a Docker layer, inside a Docker image, and it's all found by tools like, uh, no other tools, by X-Ray. Of course. Yeah, right. Then you have exciting tools that help you with projections. Yes, now this tool that I'm really excited about, you remember the question how much it will cost next year? I'm going to reveal now a very sophisticated and expensive tool that is called Microsoft Excel. <laughs> it's amazing how sometimes you don't have to overcomplicate things. We'll keep going, we're not. No, 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 we are not. And we, okay, you heard that, we need to do better, right? It's just, it's That's not a competition, but. Let's keep yeah. going. <laughs> Okay, now this is another trend prediction, and this is mission control, this example, that will give you a cost for how, many, uh, how much your storage will cost, in this example for, for uh, your uh, binary artifacts. And the answer for that, oh, that's a, that a lot. So we spoke about... Uh, customers. Customers, and we spoke about our application not being able to scale. How do you know what is the quality of your software? Like what's the best signal you guys have in your own software that tells you how good the software is? No, that's for sure. We always drink Not our always own champagne. Possible, but, but how do you know? Customer. Thank you very much. Voice of the customer. How customers express their voice? Well, there are two standard ways in the industry. Yeah, a, uh, I'll name we one. Have, we, we have great audience. I'll name one. Okay, Let's promote the survey. Right, right. So survey is good. By the uh, way, the feedback forms are on your tables. Don't we forget. may have pre-filled some of them for you. Oh, good. Um, so how, how customers express their, their concerns about the quality of your product? Defects. Hmm? Defects. Defect. Thank you Somebody very much, company. They open an incident, open a defect. So here's an example from one of... Products will protect uh, the uh, name, but of, uh, the, of the not so innocent. That's one of the products that I used to, I was asked to, to help. Now, now, what I see here is something horrible, if you ask me. 65% of incidents are severity one or severity two. That's a pretty shitty product, Leonid. 
You know, if you look at the data like that, and if you don't have the right data, remember when Billy didn't update the defect tracking system correctly, right? That's one of the reasons we need accurate data. You know what? Let me think about that. Guys, what do you think? What might be the reason that we believe, Leonid, that this product is very good, but still we have 65% severity one and severity two? Well, if you were in charge of this product, how would you go and convince him? They didn't enter the defects correctly. That might be possible. What else? Anything uh, else? We didn't fire Billy, but that's that's a, that's, 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 a, that's that's a given. That never sure. happens in real life. Billy's okay. Fine. So here is another thought. It might be that the support just don't know the product well enough, right. and they file defects when they are not bugs. They are features. features of course. So here's an example of the same chart, but now charted and sliced by the resolution. And you will see that only 19% or 20% of the defects that were fixed from that previous category were code fixes. And the rest were what's called information provided, where the developer who got escalated to had to tell support what to do. Right? If you use your data, you can enact proactive improvement. Because with the data like that, you can go to head of support and say, well, maybe we need to do more training. Maybe we need to improve the documentation. Now, without this data, what would happen is that head of support would say, my guys are fine. They know exactly what they are doing. It's your shitty product. But when you come with those numbers, this discussion won't happen anymore. And that's the key, key char characteristic of proactive improvements companies. They track data, they measure everything, and they use data to make decisions. So wrapping up, and we are way past due, um, someone knows what Epimyth is? No, this guy is not in the audience today. Well, your wife knew, but she's a literature major. All right. Uh, Epimyth is the morale of the story. It is actually a word in English. You just don't know it, but now you do. Right, Epimyth. Remember that? Useful talk. Um, well, number one, scale is scale. And that's a, an interesting statement to make, right? But one of the things I've learned helping teams evolve on this maturity curve, so things have to build one on another. You cannot simply jump from reactive to proactive improvement. It requires tools, people, and processes across all three disciplines, QA, development, and operations, to support this move. And each of those stages builds on the previous stage, right? So you have to remember that scale is scale. It's okay that you're not in proactive improvement yet. But you need to start thinking about how do you move yourself forward and what are the tools, people, and processes you need to bring to the table to help you move forward. Right. So as we mentioned, tools, process, and people, all of them have to change. And the way they are changing are by two major principles. The first one is you build it, you own it. And that's kind of the basics of DevOps. Everybody speak about that. Whatever was, delivered, whatever was coded by uh, the developers, developers are in charge to take to production. And the second one, which I favor when I come to join a development team that needs help, is pain is instructional. Right? You have to bring the pain to the source of the pain. Only then the proactive improvement will start. Only then root cause analysis will start giving you some actionable backlog to make sure that I don't have to wake up at 2 a.m. in the morning again. And what just happened is an exercise in pain is instructional. We stand here between you and wine, drinking wine. Now, all of you will forever remember what epimyth means. <laughs> right? It works. I think it was that. We don't have time for Q&A. If you want to find us, look for the top hat in the cave. Exactly. That's me, Jay Baruch, over the internet. And my name's Leonid Egolnik, at Eligolnik on the Twitters. When you praise us on Twitter, don't forget the hashtag SwampUp. Thank you very much.